Father God, we thank you once again for this opportunity to come together and to fellowship with one another. Thank you, Father, that as we study your word tonight, we thank you for revelation knowledge flowing freely, unhindered, uninterrupted by any satanic or demonic spirit. We thank you, Father God, that we decrease and you increase. All of you and none of us anoint our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our spirit to contain your word. And Father, I thank you for thinking through my mind and speaking through my vocal cords, all that you'd have me to say to these your sheep. And Father, we'll be ever so mindful to always give you the praise and always give you the glory. It's in Jesus' name and everyone in agreement. Say amen. amen. Y'all got me fired up. I like that. See, I like I'm one that come in. I like to come in preaching on, on fast music. You know, you got some people like to come in on worship. I like to come in on praise. See, I'm, I'm young. <laughs> Everybody jumped on that bandwagon, huh? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, we're teaching on a series called The Grace of God. Now, this, te this teaching, I'm going to say teasies, this teaching is designed to show us and help us understand what grace is all about. The grace of God, I'm telling you, is a product of the love of God. And the grace of God eliminates us. It eliminates work. It eliminates trying to please God through our performance. Because so many people think that the more they perform, the more God is going to love them. But I'm here to tell you that God already loves you as much as he would ever love you. Amen? Your performance has nothing to do with him loving you. Your performance helps you to love him. That's what it does. It helps us to love him, but it doesn't cause him to love us anymore. Because you got people that are not doing anything, not not coming to church, not reading their Bibles, but as long as they've accepted Jesus and haven't turned their back on him, they're going to heaven. And now religion says, I don't like that because I come to church, I read the Bible, I tithe and I do all these things, I, I perform for God. How come they get to do, go where I get to go? Because it's not about what you do, it's about what he's done. Amen? So we got to focus on that. Now, in this teaching, we're, we're talking about the origin of God, okay? And we said origin is defined as the source of something. Well, God is the source or the origin of grace, all right? The first time the word grace is ever used in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, where it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. However, God has always shown grace to his people. Even though the word may not have been used, he's always shown grace to his people, all right? Now, we also said that Jesus is the source in which God has poured his grace out on us. In John chapter 1, verse 17, it says the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, we were also talking, we, we've been talking about how the law, the Ten Commandments, uh, is called the law of death. It's also called the law of condemnation. And we've been contrasting, contrasting uh, grace with the law, showing that grace is more powerful than the law. All right? Before we go to, uh, I know everybody done turned to page six and ready to go down there Hebrews, but <laughs> I'm going to bust your bubble. We're not going, we may not even make it to the syllabus tonight. I want to go to Romans chapter four. And I want to show look at some more verses that, that, that show uh, uh, contrast performance with grace. We got to get this in our hearts because we live in a society, Christian community, I should say, that, that, that focus on performance. It's not about your performance. You know, if it was about your performance, you and I, if it was about our performance, we would never get into heaven because we couldn't keep the law. We couldn't do what God wanted us to do. So it's not about performance. It's about grace. I love, I'm telling you, if you don't have nothing, nothing else to do, you need to get in the Word and study out grace. Oh, man, there's so much to this. I'm just touching the surface of it. But there's so much to this. Uh, one person that do a good teaching on that is uh, 
Joseph Prince. He really gets in depth with that grace teaching. But a lot of people reject it. Now, sometimes I do agree. No, I ain't going to say that. I won't say that. I won't say that. That ain't right. But uh, <laughs> he, do <laughs> he, he does a great teaching on grace. Okay? All right. I want to go to Romans chapter 4. And we're going to start at verse 1. When you get there, say amen. amen. All right. Paul says, what then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Abraham was not justified because of his performance. Abraham was justified because he believed God. He had faith in God. Verse 3 tells us that. It says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. So if our performance is what caused us to be right in God's sight, then it wouldn't be a righteousness wouldn't be a gift. It would be something that was owed to us. But God ain't having that. It's a gift. The Bible calls righteousness a gift in Romans chapter 5. Okay? Y'all still with me? All right. Uh, verse 5 says, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. You see that? He said, when we believe in Jesus who justifies the ungodly. I don't know about you, but at one time I was a, a terrible ungodly person. But I've been justified. I, I've been made righteous. I've been put in right standing with God through faith. Uh, grace by faith. Okay? Not by my performance. Because I'm telling you, even now I don't always make right decisions. I <laughs> my performance is not always in line like it should be. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes people upset me. I get angry. And sometimes I express <laughs> my anger. Not like I used to, but I, I still shouldn't express it the way that I do at times. All right. But thank God that it's not based on my performance. It's based on what Jesus has already done. Amen. Praise Jesus. Verse 6 says, just as David also describes the blessedness, the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. The word imputes means to charge to your account. Okay? And David even talked about this. It's, it's in Psalm uh, 32 and verses 1 and 2 where David talks about how, matter of fact, in verse 7 tells us, it says, blessed are those who lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall, imp shall not impute sin. Shall not charge sin to your account. Isn't that awesome? That's what we've been talking about. When yeah. you mess up, God ain't charging that sin to your account. Why? Because he already charged it to Jesus' account. Jesus already paid the penalty for it. You got to get this in you because what it does, when you, once you get this revelation, Brother Chuck is teaching on divine health. If you... Ooh feel guilty if you have any guilt complex or in the condemnation it'll be hard for you to receive what brother chuck is teaching on because you think you ain't worthy you think see that's what condemnation says is that you are not worthy to receive the benefits of god well you being worthy is not based on your performance you being worthy is based on what christ did and your faith in what christ did so even when you mess up you still worthy of the benefits. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, so when sickness attack your body and you done told somebody off over here, you can still receive healing for that when the sickness attack your body because what you did over there, you, God is not holding you guilty. Mm, he's, not in, he's not charging the sin to your account. Now, I'm not advocating practicing sin because, like I said, there are consequences. Okay, but God is not holding you guilty. God is not charging it to your account because he already charged it to Jesus' account. Jesus paid the price for your sin. Hallelujah. He paid it all. Verse 9 says, 
does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised? When we talk about circumcised, it's talking about the law, people under the law. Does this bless, blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For what we, for what we say that, for we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Did, 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 did he receive his righteousness after he got circumcised or before? Before. Because it had nothing to do with his performance. You know what circumcision did? It showed what had the, the righteousness that he received before he got circumcised. That's what baptism does for us. When we get water baptized, it shows outwardly what has happened inwardly. It does not save you. It's only a ceremony, but it, and it does not save you. Like some people say, you can't go to heaven unless you're baptized. Well, that thief that Jesus say, you shall be with me in paradise, then when people say that you have to be baptized to go to heaven, they just call Jesus a liar. Because Jesus told that thief on the cross, you shall be with me. This day, you shall be with me in paradise. He didn't hit a lick of water. They, they, they didn't even spray no water on him. <laughs> All right. Well, he didn't get wet no other, except for his blood. He didn't get wet, wet no other way. But Jesus said, this day, you shall be with me in paradise. Water baptism is just like the circumcision that they got in the Old Testament. It showed that they were God's people. It showed people outwardly, people that, because people don't know what happened in your heart. But when you are baptized, you are showing them what happened. Water baptism, I encourage everybody to get baptized. Okay, Jesus said to get baptized, but it doesn't save you because it would be performance if baptized, if being baptized saved you. That still works. Amen. Praise Jesus. It says, how then was it accounted? What, verse 10, I'm reading again. While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Or uncircumcised. Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised, like Willie said. And he received the sign of circumcision. Why? It was a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, that he might be the father of those who believe, though, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Talking about us. Talking about, talking about those that are, that are not under the law. He says, Abraham became righteous through faith. And then he was sealed with the, with the circumcision to show his righteousness. But he became righteous by faith so that we also can be made righteous. We are showing us that we can be accepted without being uh, under the law. Bound by the law. The law was never designed to save people. The law was only designed to show us that we needed a savior. The law was designed to show us that we were sinning. The law was designed to show us that we were wrong. But it was never designed to save us. Because as long as you live up under the law or try to live up under the law, you will always have condemnation because you can't keep the law. You will always feel guilty. And that's the... That's how the enemy comes in. See, guilt and, and condemnation operates out of the soulish area. And that's where the enemy comes in, that he affects you. He can make you, he can cause you to turn your back on God through condemnation and guilt. Because what happens, usually when people get in condemnation and guilt, they stop reading the Bible, they, they, they stop coming to church, they stay away from other believers because they're feeling bad about themselves. And then they get mad with other believers because they're reading the Bible, going to church and doing all this, and then they start saying, oh, they think they all that, they mess up just like I do. Yeah, but they know who they are. You better learn who you are. You better know that just because you messed up, that hasn't changed your status with God. You're still righteous. Just like, this is it. Before you got saved, before you became a Christian, when you did good things, did you ever do some good things before you got saved? You ever do something nice for somebody? I hope so. <laughs> but just because you did something nice, did it change your status as a sinner? You were still a sinner, wasn't you? Even though you did good things. Well, the same principle applies now that you are saved. Just because you mess up, that don't change your status. Because your status is not based on your performance. Your status is based on 
his performance. Hallelujah. And you got to know that. You got to get that in your spirit and know that. Because if you don't, the enemy will chew you up and spit you out. But because I know who I am, I know I'm righteous. I know that I'm a child of God. When the enemy comes, I can stand my ground. You know, you know in the world they got stand your ground in the world. Well, we stand our ground in the spirit too. We stand up against the enemy. When it, in, in James chapter 4, when it talk about resisting the enemy, that word resist means to stand against. You got to stand against the attacks of the enemy. I'm going to tell you what he attack you at in your mind. He make you try to feel like you ain't worthy. See, if you was a Christian, you would have done that. I, and what you tell him, if you had any sense, you'd have never turned on God and gone about your business. He's the one stupid. But he tries to make you feel stupid. He tries to make you feel worthless. And the only way he can do that is that you don't know who you are and what you have in Christ Jesus. The Bible says we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We are, meaning that we are now. Are, that word are talks about present tense. Now. So if I'm more than a conqueror now in Christ Jesus, then that means that I'm empowered with what I need to stand against the enemy. And if you read those verses in chapter 8 of Romans, it talks about in verse 33 and 34, it talks about who can bring a charge against you because they, it, what it talks about is God is the one that uh, 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 judges us and, and, and determines whether we are guilty. And Jesus is the one that died for you. So Satan got people, family members, work, work, people that you work with, cousins and, and, uh, and friends and neighbors to come to you and try to make you feel guilty. They come and they, and they even argue with you. But you know what? When you know that you are right, you don't have to argue about it. You know, I, I, Flo and I, and, and this is a good thing, so you can still cook for me. Uh, <laughs> Flo and I, we, we, years ago, we would, get in a, we would get in a debate, right? And what Flo would do, when she knows she's right, she just shut up. Because it'll prove itself out. You know, and I'm sitting there, I'm saying, no, this is what, she said, nope, this, and she'll shut up. Why? She don't have to argue. She didn't have to argue because she knew she was right. You ain't got to argue with the devil. You tell that devil where to get off at and go on about your business. Why? Because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He mad because, he mad because God put you above him. Hallelujah. That's why he attacks the choir so much, the praise team, because that was his job. He was head of that. He, he, he led the praise team. Now, <laughs> he don't like that. <laughs> All right. Uh, verse 12. It says, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. All that's saying is that not only is he father of the uncircumcised, but he's father of the circumcised because he became circumcised. So he's father of faith. Abraham is the father of faith. And, and he's our example. He believed God. If, if, if he could believe God under the old covenant, under the Old Testament, how much more you and I under the New Testament with God living on the inside of us? Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit didn't indwell. He came on them, but he never indwelled them. See, he indwells us. He lives in us. He's, he's, he's influencing us with the love of God. You know that, don't you? A lot of times when you feel down and depressed, just get in your quiet place and listen to the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 5 where it talks about the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. He not only shared the love of God so that we can love, but he also shared the love of God in our hearts so we can know that God loves us. Yeah. If you get in that quiet place, sometimes you hear God say, I love you. Those words, <laughs> those words are more valuable than any dollar amount you can think of. I'm telling you. Those words coming from Father God in our spirit telling us, I love you. And a lot of times, 
We miss that because we're, our thoughts are clouded by guilt and condemnation. So we don't hear God speaking to us. God is constantly talking to us. The Holy Spirit ain't sitting there with a muzzle on his mouth on the inside of you. He's talking. But we cloud, we, our, our thoughts and minds are, have clouded out his voice. And the enemy uses that to keep you from communicating with God because he knows that when you get to a place where you're constantly in communication with God, constantly talking to God, he's going to direct you out of your situation. He's already provided the answer, but you need to know how to follow that path. And he'll direct you right out of that situation. John 33 and 3, he said, God said, when you call on me, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you don't know. See, the answer is on the inside of you, but your mind is clouded out by guilt and condemnation. Because, no, you're not perfect in the natural, but in the spirit you are. In God's sight, you're perfect. And that's how you got to view yourself. You got, to, you got to put your spirit in charge. See, our flesh is in charge. But you got to put your spirit in charge. You got to, let, you got to be led by your spirit man. Our flesh is not redeemed yet. Your, your thought life is not redeemed yet. But it's being redeemed through the word of God. And the full redemption will come when Jesus comes. But your spirit man is completely redeemed. You are as perfect as you're going to be in your spirit man you are just like christ in your spirit man that's who should be leading us not the thought life because the thought life is flooded by the world we have to bring our mind and our thought life in subject in submission a subjection to our spirit amen y'all all right with that Verse 13 says, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed, watch this, through the law. But how? Through the righteousness of faith. We are heirs of the world, not through the performance of keeping the law, but through our faith in Christ Jesus. See, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are righteous, and that means that you are heir. And, and now, now look what it said about him. It says, verse 13 says, heir of the world. We are in charge here, folks. But condemnation, guilt will keep you from walking in your authority. Condemnation and guilt will keep you from being in charge. I, we read the scripture last week in Romans chapter 5, verse 17, where it says we rule through grace and righteousness. We reign. Through grace and righteousness. We're in charge. Do you know, I think it's Psalm uh, 116.15, I believe it is. It might be 115.16. It says that the heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth belongs to man. Adam was put in charge of the earth. He gave up that authority when he disobeyed God. But, but Jesus, but Jesus came back and got our authority back. And he's given the authority back to us. We got, we're to rule and reign in this earth. We're to take charge. You're to, but you first got to take charge of your own life. How you going to take charge of the house of God when your life all, ain't, 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 you ain't even got in uh, charge of your life? When you letting the devil run all over you. If you got a ministry going on, he's going to run all over your ministry. Because if he's running all over you, then he's going to run all over your ministry. And the only reason why he's running all over you is because you don't know who you are. You don't know what you have. You don't know what you can do. And the reason why you don't know what you can do and what you have and who you are is because you ain't taking the time to find out. So many people sit in the pews depending upon the pastor to read the Bible to them. Because they won't read it at home. They won't study at home. Now we got, and then I need to say this, we do have that group that read through their Bible in a year. Didn't learn nothing. Just read through the Bible in a year. Just to get a pat on the back. Nothing wrong with reading through the Bible. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that you have to read through it to a, through a year, in a year's time. It says study to show thyself approved a workman rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. We're to study the Bible. It, see, people read through the Bible so they can run to the pastor Chuck. Pastor Chuck, you're right. I read through my Bible in a year. They looking for a pat on the back. 
walk out and get, get defeated every time. Because you can't learn like that. If you listen to Brother Chuck, he tell you he read through, but well, Brother Chuck study. Brother Chuck would break out about six or seven Bibles and let them interpret itself. 26 translation. You see what I'm saying? We do it for religious reasons and for a pat on the back. That's not helping you. I've, I'm, this is, I'm talking about me. I'm, in, uh, I'm reading in the book of Acts right now. And I've been reading, I haven't got through in two years. I haven't, see, I haven't read the Bible through in a year. It took me a long time. The last time I read through the Bible took me five years. Because I don't just, I get a scripture and I'm like, I get the dictionary. I want to know it. See, I'm, I'm, I'm dissecting these verses so I know. I want to know who I am. Because, see, you can just read the surface. You can just read the surface of things and not get who you are. But when you get in there and you study, we mm -hmm. need to make this Bible as important to us as our jobs are. You got people, when they go to work, they give you, a, most jobs give you a, a, a guideline of what you, how to do their job and what you're supposed to do and all that, right? Man, we bring that thing home and we study from page from one end of the page to the other we flip it up and look at it we put it under the microscope so we can get it down why because we want to make sure we don't lose our job well living a victorious life here on earth should be just as important to you you should take that bible and just and just and just dissect every verse dissect every word buy spend money buy a dictionary a bible dictionary buy the, uh, the strong's concordance the next outfit you get say no i'm not gonna buy an outfit I'm going to get me a, a living Bible. I'm going to get me an amplified Bible. I'm going to get me a Strong's Concordant. Invest in the Bible, and then you'll be able to invest in your clothes. Well, <laughs> verse 14 says, For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made what? Void. No effect. And the promise made of no effect. What promise? The promise that Jesus, that it talks about in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 say where Jesus became a curse for us by hanging on the cross. Why? The verse 14 says so that the blessing of Abraham may come upon us and we may receive the promise of the spirit. Well the promise that God gave Abraham is void if, it's, if we have to get it through performance. It's not a gift anymore. I got to work and get it. So the promise is made of no effect to me. So the promise is that if, if it's based on my performance, then all the promises that God have in the Bible are no effect to me. Because all the promises of God is received through faith and patience. Hebrews 6 and 10, 6 and 12. All right, y'all all right with that? Verse 15 says, because the law brings about wrath. Look at that. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. So what he's saying here is if, you, if you're going to live by the law, then you're going to experience the wrath of God. Because you can't keep the law. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. So he was saying that the law was brought in to show us our transgression. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You don't, listen, we, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm trying to see if I should say this. <laughs> we fighting to get the Ten Commandments in the courthouse. But we need to fight to get grace in the courthouse. We need to fight to get grace up on the wall. The grace of God. Let people know that they're saved by grace and not by their performance. I'm not coming against the Ten Commandments. Because that's God's moral law and it shows who, what God likes. But we need to fight to get grace up there. Let folks know. If, if people know that God loves them, if people know that God doesn't, his love doesn't change, he loves everybody, the homosexual, the murderer, the, the thief, if they can find that out, they'll change. Love, the Bible says that the goodness of the Lord, the goodness, Romans 2 and 4, leads to repentance. If people can see and understand that God is good and, and, and that, that his love endures, his mercy endures forever, people's lives will change. Putting them under condemnation is not going to change them. It's going to push them away. But showing them the love of God will change them, and that's what grace is about. Grace is a product of God's love. 
I'm telling you, you mm -hmm. need to get in your Bible. You need to and study out this grace. I, the more I said it last week, the more I study it out, the more I'm finding out how much God loves us. I'm telling you, man, God loves you. you can, your mm -hmm. mind can't even fathom. Your mm -hmm. mind can't grasp, can't wrap around how much God loves you. That's awesome. You know, I think it's Ephesians chapter 3. It says his love passes all human thinking, all human reasoning. Amen. God loves you. He loves you. And nothing you do, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, nothing you do can ever separate yourself from his love. Nothing. Now, he may not like everything you do, but his love for you never changes. That's awesome. And if you get that in your spirit, I'm telling you, it'll help you walk in victory. Amen. Amen. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for that, that you are unveiling and revealing to us your love for us, Lord. And we just thank you so much. We don't focus so much on our love for you, but we focus on your love for us. For it's your love for us that constrains us. It's your love for us that, 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 that sustains us and keeps us. And we just thank you so much. And you express that love to us through Jesus, your son. Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. And we thank you in Jesus' name.